Hi, Steve O'Connor with Midwest Panel Builders, and today we're going to talk about navigating with GPS with radio navigation capability as opposed to GPS only. So we have a lot of conversations with builders about which navigators to install on their panels, whether they want to use units like the uh, GTN 650, 635, 625, or the newer GNX 375. I think we need to start with a quick overview of the units themselves, but first I'd like to start off by saying that in no way am I trying to change anybody's mind on this subject. Uh, I'm just going to present some facts and let people decide on their own. I do not push customers one way or the other uh, because it's really up to them how they want to go. Uh, any opinions that are in this video are mine and we may not agree and that's fine because what's good for me may not be good for you. Okay, so let's start talking about the units themselves, starting with the GTN 650XI. The GTN 650XI is a WAS GPS with nav and comm capabilities built in, so not only can we navigate via GPS, but we also have the navigation radio, which allows us to tune in ground-based navigational aids such as VOR and ILS to not only navigate VOR to VOR, but also to perform VOR, ILS, or localizer approaches. The GTN 650 also has a built-in comm radio. Like the GTN 650, the GTN 635 and GTN 625 are WAS GPS units. However, neither will have the navigation radio built into them, so you'll be navigating only by GPS. The GTN 635 has a comm radio built in, while the GTN 625 has no radio tuning. And now to the GNX 375. This unit is similar to the GTN 625 in that it is a WAS GPS and it has no nav or comm features. However, this is where the similarities end. Unlike the GTN series of navigators, the GNX375 has an ADS-B in and out transponder built into the unit. This will save you a bit of cost, which we'll break down a little later. I think the next thing we need to look at are the legalities of equipping your airplane with a GPS only navigator. Okay, so let's look at FAR 91205. Paragraph D instrument flight rules states, for IFR flight, the following instruments and equipment are required. So while this section does list the required instruments, D2 is what we're interested in, and it states, two-way radio communication and navigation equipment suitable for the route to be flown. So what exactly does this mean? Well, when we look at 125.203, communication and navigation equipment, we see section D, use of a single independent navigation system for operations under IFR. It states, the airplane may be equipped with a single independent navigation system suitable for navigating the airplane along the route to be flown with the degree of accuracy required for ATC if it can be shown that the airplane is equipped with at least one other independent navigation system suitable in the event of loss of navigation capability of the single independent navigation system permitted by this paragraph at any point along the route for proceeding safely to a suitable airport and completing an instrument approach. So the next question would be, how does a single WAS GPS receiver satisfy this requirement? First, we need to take a look at the WAS system and how it works. Unlike traditional ground-based navigational aids, the WAS system has a more extensive coverage area. So in simple terms, a satellite has an atomic clock. It sends out a signal with its position and timestamp to a GPS receiver. That receiver takes that signal to determine its position in relation to that satellite. When you take more than one satellite, you need three to actually triangulate. You add a fourth one in and we get a three-dimensional position. So the problem is, is even with the atomic clocks, we still have a discrepancy in time between the satellites and Earth. And we also have an ionosphere interference that will cause the signals to slow down, which will also create a discrepancy. This is where WAS, or the Wide Area Augmentation System, comes to the rescue. Let's take a look at how WAS works. Wide area reference stations are linked to form the U.S. WAS network. Signals from GPS satellites are monitored by these wide area reference stations to determine satellite clock, orbital, and position corrections. Each station in the network relays the data to a wide area master station, where the correction information is computed then uplinked via a ground earth station to a geostationary satellite. The message is then broadcast to WAS receivers within the broadcast coverage area. In addition to providing the correction signal, the WAS Geo satellite provides an additional range measurement to the aircraft receiver while also providing additional GPS satellite in view. The integrity of GPS is improved through real-time monitoring and the accuracy is improved by providing corrections to reduce errors. This performance improvement is sufficient enough to enable approach procedures with GPS WAS vertical guidance. 
So far, the FAA has completed installation of three geosatellite links, 38 wide area reference stations, three wide area master stations, six ground earth stations, as well as a required terrestrial communication to support the WAS network, including two operational control centers. So now that we have a better understanding of WAS, let's look at the aeronautical information manual for clarification on the FARs. If we dig into section one of the aeronautical information manual, navigational aids, and we look at paragraph eight, part C general requirements, we see the following text. GPS WAS was developed to be used within the geo coverage over North America without the need for other radio navigation equipment appropriate to the route of flight to be flown. Outside the WAS coverage or in the event of a WAS failure, GPS WAS equipment reverts to GPS only operation and satisfies the requirements for basic GPS equipment. So in this text, it would appear that one WAS GPS unit is considered two forms of navigation, one being the WAS system and the second, the GPS itself in the event of WAS failure. Now, if we look at paragraph nine, it states, unlike TSO C129 or non-WAS avionics, which were certified as a supplement to other means of navigation, WAS avionics are evaluated without reliance on other navigation systems. As such, installation of WAS avionics does not require the aircraft to have other equipment appropriate to the route to be flown. So in short, if your aircraft is equipped with a WAS GPS receiver, it satisfies the requirements of 91205 and 125-203 for required navigation equipment in your aircraft. So now that we know it's possible to equip our aircraft with only WAS GPS for navigation, what are the arguments against this configuration? The first and least common is the possibility of WAS GPS outages. And while there are areas that this can be a problem, like near the edge of the WAS coverage area, for the vast majority of the U.S. this will never be an issue. We can turn to the FAA website to look at the current WAS coverage. So another issue with GPS could be jamming, whether it's intentional, such as the military running operations, or the individual that's trying to evade their boss so that they can't be GPS tracked by having a um, handheld jamming unit. This is illegal. Uh, it has happened at a few airports in the past, it's very rare, but the FAA and the FCC do actively look for this type of jamming so that they can eliminate the issue. Now in the instance of a military operation, it is generally, well one, it's usually notumed, but generally it does not affect pilots too often. But if it does, you would uh, definitely need to contact ATC immediately and let them know that you're having a GPS issue, and then they could notify the proper authorities to stop the jamming. So let's assume for a moment that you did lose all GPS and you had no ability to navigate at that point. All is not lost because with the help of ATC, we can do uh, a few different approaches. We can do an ASR approach, which is non-precision, in which you'll get lateral guidance with step downs along the way, or we could do a PAR if they're equipped, which would be a precision approach. And in this case, we're gonna get not only lateral guidance, but we also get the vertical guidance down to the runway. So in any event, with ATC's help, uh, we'd definitely be able to navigate. It, we haven't lost anything else. We can still fly headings. We can still do everything that we would normally do. So uh, really, this isn't gonna be an issue. If you live in an area with a lot of GPS outages, then the GTN 650 might be your choice. The one caveat would be that uh, you would actually have to find an airport with an ILS or VOR approach. And if it requires DME in order to identify points along that approach, you might be out of luck since most of us still use the GPSs to identify those points on the approach. So one of the arguments that we often hear about using a WAS only GPS as a single navigation source is in the flight planning and alternate selection. This is in reference to the one, two, three rule when we are doing IFR flight planning. The rule states that from an hour before to an hour after your scheduled arrival, if the weather is forecasted to have a ceiling of less than 2,000 feet with visibility less than three miles, you have to file an alternate. And that alternate must meet the following minimums. For a precision approach procedure, the forecasted ceiling needs to be at least 600 feet with a visibility of two statute miles. For a non-precision approach procedure, the ceiling needs to be at least 800 feet with the visibility also two statute miles. And again, we'll turn to the aeronautical information manual for the requirements while using only WAS GPS for navigation. 
9A states pilots with WAS receivers may flight plan to use any instrument approach procedure authorized for use with their WAS avionics as the planned approach at a required alternate. However, when using WAS at an alternate airport, flight plan must be based on flying the RNAV GPS, LNAV, or circling minima, and non-precision weather requirements must be used for planning. But it also states that upon arrival at an alternate, when the WAS navigation system indicates that LNAV, VNAV, or LPV service is available, then vertical guidance may be used to complete the approach using the displayed level of service. So the argument is that when you're flying with a WAS only GPS, that you might have to plan for extra fuel to fly to an alternate with the forecasted non-precision minimums. While this may be true, those flying for recreation do not have the same time constraints as those flying for business or commercial purposes, so we can more easily make that go, no-go decision. Secondly, even though I can't file a certain airport uh, on a flight plan because of the minimums, uh, I can fly to any alternate I want, and I can fly the approach all the way down to the minimums prescribed for the approach that I am trying to fly. So really, this is only going to affect you in the flight planning portion. So another concern that people have had is actually not GPS related, but comm related. So units like the GTN 650 and the 635 will have the comm built in, while the 625 and the GNX 375 will not have comm. When we use the GNX 375, for instance, we typically install the GTR 20 comm radio. This is a remote mounted radio that is controlled directly through the G3X screen. The concern raised is that if the screen goes out, you will not have control of the radio. And while this statement is true, in the unlikely event that you do lose a screen, if you have a second screen, that will allow you to still control the comm radio. However, if you only had one screen or you lost both of those screens, then the radio would fail safe to 121.5, which would allow you to still communicate with air traffic control since they monitor that frequency. While I know that there are likely more arguments against flying with a WAS only GPS, which I'm sure we'll hear in the comments, uh, these are the most common ones that we get. So now that we've talked about what you can't do with WAS only GPS, let's take a look at what you can do. As of January 30th, 2020, there are 4,048 WAS LPV approach procedures serving 1,954 airports. 1,186 of these have no ILS. There are also 724 localizer performance approach procedures serving 531 airports, of which 429 do not have ILS. An LPV approach oftentimes will have minimums that match that of an ILS, while the LP approach is similar to a localizer only approach. And most, if not all, of the airports that have an ILS will have an LPV approach. That's a lot of airports you can fly to without the need for an ILS. At my home airport in Lapeer, we have three approaches a VOR Alpha, and two RNAV approaches. But the RNAV approaches are the only ones that are straight in. So the last question that needs to be addressed is why not just use the GTN 650? If it can do all the same RNAV approaches as the GNX 375 plus an ILS or VOR approach, I mean, it seems like a clear choice. So it really comes down to one major difference, and that's price. With the added benefit of not having to install an antenna in the tail, and the real estate that we gain on the panel, which with everything we're trying to fit in the panels today, that's actually a big consideration. The GNX375 is about six tenths of an inch smaller in height than the GTN series. Now having designed a lot of panels, I know that this is sometimes the difference in making everything fit. Some pilots, especially those coming from certified aircraft, will say that the smaller screen size makes it harder to use. Many times they ask for the GTN 750 because they want the bigger screen size, which if you're putting this into a traditional steam gauge aircraft, I can definitely understand the concern. However, when coupled with the G3X system, as is mostly the case with experimental built aircraft these days, and certainly with the panels we build, that concern is no longer an issue. 95% of the things you do with the GPS can be handled right from the G3X directly. You can change flight plans on the fly and send the changes to the navigator. You can even transfer flight plans from ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot without the need for additional equipment like the flight stream. I can honestly see a day in the not too distant future when the GPS will also become a remote mounted unit freeing up even more panel space. Now back to the biggest advantage which is price and it can be substantial. When you compare the GTN 650 to the 635 or the 625 the savings is not as big. With the pricing coming in around $10,900 for the 650. 10,000 for the 635 and 9,400 for the 625.
with the 625 actually being a little bit more than the 635 when you factor in a com radio such as the GTR20 for around $1,000, bringing the total to $10,400. However, with the GNX375, we see a bigger savings. The price of the unit is around $6,800, but has the equivalent to a GTX45R transponder built into the unit, saving an additional $3,500. Now if we factor in the cost of a remote mount GTR20, we have a cost of around $7,800. As opposed to the GTN 650XI, which costs $10,900, then we need to add the GTX 45R to cost of $3,500 to give us a total of $14,400. That's a potential savings of around $6,600, which is quite substantial. So the last point that I'll make is that if you're planning on getting your instrument rating in your airplane, then you will need the GTN 650. FAR 6165 requires three different approaches with navigational systems, and the ACS still requires that you demonstrate precision and non-precision approaches. So keep that in mind. So which way you go really is down to personal preference. If you like the security of having the ILS and VOR capabilities built in, then the GTN 650 is gonna be for you. If you're a little more budget-minded and you're okay with the WAS only GPS, then the GNX375 is also a great choice. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell as well. If you have any questions at all, you can reach us at 810-356-3855. You can also visit us online, www.midwestpanels.com.